Um, we are taking um, collectively, we're working on trying to take a fork in the road that leads us toward long-term sustainability and vitality and survival of, the, of our species, right? Um, but it's kind of like a bag of popcorn in the microwave. And so you start off with like a couple little kernels that are popping and Boston is one of the kernels and the development community in Boston is one of the kernels, but I'm starting to see it sort of speed up, you know, that critical part in the microwave where it's all like, Brrr! so that's sort of <laughs> starting to happen. about the Green Ribbon Commission, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. We are about seven or eight years old now. It is a volunteer coalition. We actually don't have any legal status whatsoever, which is <laughs> fantastic. Um, it's a voluntary coalition of uh, about 35 CEOs and senior executives, mostly from the real estate development and financial <coughs> sector here in Boston. Uh, Carol Wedge is a member from uh, as an architect. We also have the uh, CEOs of Partners Healthcare, uh, the president of BU, and a number of other senior executives from major hospitals and universities in Boston. And we were formed originally to work with the city on mitigation of climate change, reducing the gases, uh, the emissions of gases that cause the climate change problem. Uh, and uh, I began first as a member of the Green Ribbon Commission when I was the CEO of the Aquarium. And then as this uh, resilience issue arose, uh, particularly from the work that was done originally by Boston Harbor Now and BSA and others, um, the commission decided to develop a separate track on resilience. So it, it's really focused on two tracks, uh, mitigation and resilience. We partner very, very closely with the city um, in, on all of these projects. We actually helped conceive the original Climate Ready Boston project, helped raise a lot of money, which is really been nice for these projects in that they're a combination of government funding, private philanthropy, and uh, uh, contributions from major corporations in the city. So we have a really good group of people who are behind this work. Um, and then we've continued to work with the city. As, we're, we're, as Jay said, we're really in this important transition phase right now where there's been a huge amount of technical analysis. We started with updating the science projections of how climate was going to change in Boston. We then did a citywide vulnerability analysis, uh, then, a, then an implementation roadmap of what the city needs to do over the next five years. That the city has, I think, done a very, very capable job of implementing now sort of a year or two into phase two of this project. And then what you're going to hear more about today are the more detailed resilience plans that have been done in various neighborhoods around the waterfront uh, with a couple more to go that will be done over the next year. And what's been really great for me in all of this work is not only the fact that we are going to make Boston more resilient, and as I always say, prevent us from having to move to Worcester. <laughs> We're also going to make a really great waterfront. You know, if we can carry through on these plans the next two years, uh, next two decades, um, we're going to really enhance public access. We're going to open up the harbor to the city in ways that it just hasn't been in a really long time, and at the same time, create these natural buffer zones that will protect the city for the many decades to come. Uh, my name is Maya, and I'm the Climate Ready Boston Program Manager out of the City of Boston Environment Department. I'm going to give you first an update on the Climate Ready Boston work and the program in general, and where we've been um, the last few months to the last year, and then turn it over to Carly Foster, who's our principal consultant on the South Boston project, to give you a preview of some of the findings and um, recommendations from that report, which will be out in the coming weeks. So as you all know, these are the, the top impacts that we're focused on in Climate Ready Boston as an initiative of the city. More hot days, more precipitation, and more sea level rise. And just this winter, this, um, the storms that we experienced really gave this work a big push because um, we saw the impact so clearly across the city. We saw our flood maps validated. We saw a lot of our flood entry points and flood pathways that we're studying and trying to address um, in real life what it could look like. These are the areas of the city that we are uh, most focused on for our coastal resilience flood protection work and our, our district scale efforts. These are the areas that are all on the waterfront, but it's where um, the flood pathways uh, begin and where um, more inland and major parts of the cities are impacted. So it's the locations that we really want to focus on to have the broadest possible neighborhood and community impact. And as Bud mentioned, um, be able to look at the co-benefits of this work. How are we improving our waterfront? How are we improving open space and infrastructure as we make these investments? And how do we connect these investments to ongoing projects and plans in the city? 
So our East Boston and Charlestown report came out um, almost a year ago now. Um, we have visions like this for the long-term uh, shoreline of East Boston, and Chris is going to talk to you about some financing and zoning studies that are going to be underway uh, this fall and into next year to figure out how to really implement um, these visions. And then it resulted in um, pretty practical implementation projects. This is the deployable flood wall that was installed in July across the East Boston Greenway. Um, it's it's a, a small project, but it's one that has a pretty significant impact for this part of East Boston. And it was our, our first real attempt at funding and designing and installing a, a resiliency measure in the city with a different department. So this was funded and installed by the Parks Department um, and is, is ready for use. The um, elevation of Main Street was the short-term <coughs> action that came out of the Charlestown report. All of these actions and all of these projects are really um, an example and an opportunity for a partnership across city departments and for mainstreaming this work across the work of other departments. Um, this is a partnership with the Transportation Department and their Sullivan Square redesign. Uh, because the timing of the projects um, worked out so well, we were able to understand this recommendation at a time when that project could um, take it in themselves and move forward to fund and implement this elevation as part of this larger investment into the Sullivan Square um, neighborhood and transportation system. <coughs> We're working with the Parks Department on the Mobile <coughs> Park Vision Plan. This is another huge opportunity for this work to really connect with um, other interests and other priorities that the city and the neighborhoods have for improved park space, improved waterfront access, for improved um, transportation infrastructure, improved accessibility. Mobley Park is a 60 acre waterfront park. It's bigger than the Boston Commons. And um, it's a real chance to show how, while we protect the neighborhoods from, from flooding through parks and open space, we can really achieve so many other important goals across the city. And we're moving in the policy and the design standards direction. Now this is a project that Chris will tell you a lot about in more detail, but it started with this flood hazard area map that the BPDA put out um, at the end of last year. And this gave us specific design flood elevations for every single parcel across the city. How do you prepare for 40 inches of sea level rise, which is our um, mid to late century climate projection. Um, so now with this, with this data, it's very clear exactly sort of what number uh, buildings need to be preparing for and working with today. And this is the, the flood extent that's gonna be moved forward into that zoning conversation that Chris will go into further detail on. We've also been working with our public works department on uh, climate resilient design standards for infrastructure and for the public rights away across the city. So this is also an exciting project that will be coming out in the coming weeks, looking at what are the specific design guidance, costs, operations and maintenance guidance, um, engineering specifications for building um, elevated berms and park spaces, roadways, um, using the harbor walk as flood protection, using deployable flood barrier systems across the city. What does that really look like and how do we make sure that this work is done consistently and effectively every time a project um, comes up that should be integrating these type of solutions. <coughs> Our Landmarks Commission on the side has, um, on the left side here, has recently put out design guidance for um, historic buildings and what uh, resiliency uh, for historic buildings could look like across some of the major um, historic districts across the city that are also in this future floodplain. So this is a really interesting project to advance that conversation. How do we continue advancing resiliency um, in these historic districts that have so many um, requirements and constraints around what can be built in them and, and how this topic and sort of sustainability and climate action in general can be better integrated into our historic districts across the city. And this project on the right is also live on our website. Um, a project tracker of all of these coastal resilience recommendations. Um, where are they? What do they look like? What status are they in? Um, what type of strategy are they advancing? How do you get more information? We want to really put a lot of this information out there so you can better understand and track what the city is working on and how we're advancing 
all of these solutions across the waterfront, across um, all several city departments who are actively working on this issue. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carly, who will give you a preview of our South Boston report, which is our next major neighborhood resilience study, which will be coming out uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you. Thanks so much, Maya. And before I get started, I wanted to comment on something that um, you heard Maya say multiple times during her presentation. She was referring to the need for partnerships. And I think that um, it's, it's really important to continuously emphasize that resilience is really all of our responsibility. And resilience is not an industry. Someday, every single decision that we will be made will consider resilience as a prerequisite in that decision-making process. It will be at the baseline of those decisions. And a lot of what Maya uh, spoke about was sort of that, that process that Boston is working through right now, kind of embedding resilience into the very fabric of the, uh, the decision-making decision process. So um, oftentimes when we talk about South Boston, there's a question of, um, so why South Boston? Why, why should we be looking here? And I think that, um, some of some of what's here really points to that. This is a busy slide, so I'm going to focus in on what I think is is really critical. Um, right now, South Boston population is around 30 to 40 thousand people. By 2030, that population is expected to double to 60 thousand. There's about 80 thousand jobs in this community. Many of them um, are uh, for low-income workers, and when folks that are more vulnerable, more vulnerable populations are impacted by natural disasters those impacts can be much, much longer lasting. And so you have to protect the entire fabric um, with which um, they're reliant on. South Boston itself contributes about $20 billion to the city's economy annually. So super, uh, super important community here. And we are starting to see sort of the blue sky impacts that are possible within this neighborhood. Um, these are images from astronomical high tides. Um, I believe it was last winter. This was not during the winter storms. Um, another thing I just want to point out really quickly is, and I think everyone here is aware of this, so much of Boston was built on filth. So this image is of sort of the historical shoreline of South Boston in 1852. It was really um, the South Boston neighborhood, which remains the high ground today and is um, going to remain relatively unscathed through the end of the century at the very least. Um, but then the area that is, is Phil is, uh, coincides quite well with our, I'm gonna fall over there, um, our flood risk <laughs> maps, right, which show a progression of flood risk over time. And this land, this fill, when it was put into place, was put to, to protect against kind of tides, right? And it's relatively flat, which is why you see sort of this sheet flow, um, this potential sheet flow across the neighborhood. What you're looking at is um, a progression of the 1% annual chance uh, flood extents. And it's important to note that not one single storm could ever provide this, these flood extents. This is sort of an aggregate of 1% annual chance. So sometimes a 1% annual chance storm might happen here, but not necessarily over here, which is why you didn't see consistent flooding uh, across the community um, during the winter storms last year. So what you can see in the very dark here is the um, current 1% annual chance event. And then we also provide that event with nine inches of sea level rise, or elevation, I apologize, nine inches of sea level rise and 40 inches of sea level rise. Um, a couple things that I think are important to point out about this image that um, I would like on as a resilience planner. Um, I mentioned that it's, it's flat. And so there isn't really high ground to tie into. And what that tells you is that we need collective action along the waterfront um, in order to accomplish the work. It, it's not that we can do, um, we can protect sort of to here. If, if you're familiar with the big U in New York City, they're able to kind of do things in, in certain increments and they can uh, protect uh, um, whole segments of Manhattan. But if you only build something here, and not over here, eventually they're going to flood from behind. So this is sort of an important planning tool, right? Um, another um, mention is that th sort of further pointing to the criticality of South Boston is the potential for the South End to flood through the Four Point Channel. So um, in the long term, that's, that's an um, important point. And then um, it also tells us that uh, like when we were doing the focus groups for this project, we met with kind of folks that lived, worked, 
owned property within the South Boston neighborhood. And we looked in, in sort of different chunks because we wanted these people kind of in the same room together talking about what would work. We wanted them to push toward collective action. And one of the things that they wanted to know is, you know, do we really need to do work along the waterfront? Right? Does it make sense for us to be elevating the waterfront or could we move further back? Um, and this is where I think the monthly high tide comes in. Over time, um, you know, there's the potential for the loss of the Harbor Walk and for those properties to flood more and more. So what this points to is a need for both policy and infrastructure and sort of edge <coughs> solutions. So, um, and I think the, the point of optimism is, is really important to stress here because Everything that we're uh, talking about today is is very possible, and I'm super excited to see how it's all going, uh, uh, to watch it sort of all unfold. Um, what you also saw in that last image is that um, a lot of action has to take place sort of at the same time, right, Co coincident with one another. And so what we've developed in the implementation roadmap are these sort of four tracks. Um, and so track one, th three of the tracks, one, two, and three, coincide with sort of geographic locations. And then the fourth track is relevant, obviously, to all of South Boston and potentially even the entire city. And that's sort of these more inland and regulatory solutions, infrastructure partnerships, things like that. Um, so track one is the South Boston Waterfront and Fort Point Channel. This area is really heavily characterized by private land ownership. Right, you've got some. You've also got some really important uh, community resources here. You have the Boston Children's Museum, the Federal Courthouse, the ICA. Um, you've got the Gillette Manufacturing Facility down here, GE's headquarters. A lot of different property owners and a lot of different parties parties in this area. Um, track two is uh, Seaport Boulevard, Marine Industrial Park, and Reserve Channel. This is heavily dominated by mass port ownership, and so you can see that we've got these tracks divided also by the types of partnerships that will be needed to help encourage the projects to move forward. Um, and then uh, track three, this space all along here is predominantly owned by DCR. And so they can work through this process with um, a master planning effort. Um, one that they're, they're also, um, they're doing these master planning efforts in other parts of the state as well. And so we were able to kind of bring this area to the forefront of, of their thought processes. And uh, Chris is gonna speak about some of the sort of inland and regulatory solutions building on what Maya said a little bit earlier that are gonna be needed over time. Um, we do, we cannot entirely rely on these simply because it, it takes time, right? It takes time to implement regulation. It takes time to retrofit existing infrastructure. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to kind of be protecting along the edge. So when we look at these sort of uh, the waterfront resilience measures, we look at this in, in sort of three components. The first is the alignment. So where does it make sense for the solution to take place? And I talked to you a little bit about the process that we use to determine um, where, where we should be looking in terms of whether we would be inland or outland. Um, and we also look at sort of the technical approach and some of the technical approaches are listed along here and I'll talk a little bit more about those. And then we also talk about sort of the design. So the alignment is where, the uh, technical approach is what, and then the design is sort of how are you experiencing this. And so the report that you're gonna see that's gonna be released um, presents options and recommendations related to alignment. It provides options and recommendations related to technical approaches, and then it provides examples related to design because really the design process and even more engagement is gonna really uh, determine how you can experience these. And um, just pointing to what, uh, emphasizing what Bud mentioned a little bit earlier, these solutions can really be used to enhance your experience with waterfront. Um, there's a lot of park space opportunities in here and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So in each of these areas, in each of these tracks, there are multiple options um, presented within the report. And where it's appropriate to have recommendations, there are recommendations, but in some cases, further investigation is needed and, and further um, stakeholder engagement. So this is a close-up of the Fort Point Channel, and this is sort of um, an example of what I was just talking about in life. 
Um, we have two alignment options in Fort Point Channel. We can go sort of around the channel, or we can um, we can work at the end of the channel. And this also, these two options could potentially be combined as well. And so you'll see that in the report that any any one of these areas and some of the areas, some of these options can also be combined. Um, this also points to how some options can be completed incrementally over time, tackling sort of the highest priority areas versus, um, versus happening all at once. And the cost of these two solutions, the cost of going around the perimeter of the channel or um, installing a, a gate structure at the mouth of, of the channel are pretty comparable from a cost perspective. But we have recommended that the community or that the city start with this incremental solution around the perimeter for multiple reasons. Um, one is that you cannot complete the gate solution incrementally. And so there are, as we have seen, current uh, flood risk hazards um, coming to light right within you know, the area of the 100 acre master plan. This is sort of the, the highest priority area. Um, and so the amount of time that it would take to implement that, for example, um, is, is much shorter than this. Another issue is uh, sea level rise itself. So as um, with sea level rise, events are going to become more frequent, higher magnitude events are going to become more frequent, and that requires gates such as this to close more frequently. And then eventually you're sort of clapping, and then eventually it has to stay completely closed. If you're familiar with the uh, report that we supported the development of with uh, the University of Massachusetts Boston, it, it talked a lot about that consideration. And um, it'd be real, I'd be really interested to know kind of how many gates around the world sort of considered that increasing flood risk over time. Um, but eventually, you could, you could do both, right? And, and it, it would probably make more financial sense to do this later, right, and extend the useful life of this solution versus doing it earlier. Also, um, it's a lot more difficult to increase sort of the height of this over time versus increasing the height and extent of a perimeter solution. There's a lot of things we can do here. We can go, um, you know, for areas that we're proposing elevated park space, for example, you can go higher in that elevated park space. You can go deeper. And then depending on the regulatory environment, and that's some of the investigation that we did as part of this project as well, um, related to permitting some of these solutions, you can, if you extend it out into the water, you can go even, even longer period of time. So this, um, this image is really a, a snapshot of the implementation plan. We talk about this in terms of what you're seeing right now are three major time frames. Work to be completed in the near term by 2025, work to be completed um, by the 2040s, sort of over the course of the next 25 years, and then um, work that needs to be completed in the 2050s and beyond. Um, what we did actually in the implementation roadmap, and you'll see this in the report, is we have increments that are even smaller than this, and they're in roughly every five years. So we've broken it down into kind of every five year increments to make this sort of doable, and, and, um, and, it, and it focuses on sort of the highest risk areas first and takes into consideration different development actions and so on and so forth. And so you can see that the two highest priority areas right now are um, this, this red area along Fort Point Channel, which is the 100 acre master plan, um, the, the GE site moving into sort of the South Boston Manufacturing Center and the Seaport Boulevard. This area alone can protect about $300 million in, um, in, in losses against that. And, uh, and we've got tens of millions of dollars of protection that can come from the Seaport Boulevard um, protection here. Another thing to point out about the Seaport Boulevard area is um, a lot of the space along South Boston, it, it, we're very space constrained. Um, and so you can, uh, I was mentioning you can increase things incrementally over time. Um, most of these protections we're proposing uh, be in, implemented to the 40 inches of sea level rise, the 1% annual chance elevation with one foot of freeboard, which is like a safety factor. And so that puts you sort of around elevation 14 um, and ABD 88. And so I guess that's like 20. 20 something in Boston City Base. But the Seaport Boulevard would start maybe a little bit lower to protect sight lines, and then over time that could go higher. And that would still get us through 2030 and beyond. Um, and the work in the midterm can and should be expedited wherever possible. And obviously, the timing of this could be affected by uh, the rate of sea level rise. 
questions? So there's a lot of things that I didn't say because I don't want to, you know, get out in front of the mayor's announcement. But hopefully that kind of gave you a, that gave you a good flavor, a taste of, of what's. to see so many of you out on a Friday morning for a holiday weekend. <laughs> so this uh, past month, uh, the Boston Planning and Development Agency uh, has initiated an ambitious effort to develop uh, recommendations for a flood resiliency uh, zoning overlay district as well as uh, resiliency design guidelines. Uh, much of this is uh, really following on Climate Ready Boston and the Resiliency Initiatives uh, framework and, and roadmap that, that Bud had indicated and is really um, the, the next, I think, logical step in preparedness planning uh, for the state. We started off with Climate Ready a couple of years ago that outlined a broad framework of hazards and vulnerabilities that we're going to be facing. Uh, then over the past year or two, we've uh, been covering the district scale initiatives that Maya and Carl have spoken of and the types of shoreline infrastructure we're going to need to have in place to protect uh, these more discrete flood pathways. And now with this effort, we're getting down to the building and the parcel scale. How can we advance resiliency um, through regulations and, and code? Um, to assist us in this effort, we brought on a consultant team led by UTEAL, uh, joined by Kleinfelder, Noble, Wickersham, and Hart, as well as HDR Engineering and Offshoots. Um, I should note this is a grant-funded program. Uh, the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program has provided us with the funding uh, for this. So we're, we're thankful for their, their support in this endeavor. Um, given we're just starting out on this, I, I really today am going to be covering uh, in large part just the scope and tasks uh, that are involved as well as what we hope to achieve uh, through the project. Um, as many of you know, the, the Boston Planning and Development Agency is on point for administering the city's zoning code as well as uh, community planning efforts and uh, development review. Uh, to that end, we've been advancing a number of aspects of Climate Ready Boston that will relate to promoting a more resilient uh, development fabric, uh, really how projects and, and new development can be prepared for increased heat, sea level rise, as well as precipitation. Uh, some of the things we've, we've done already uh, through our community planning processes, uh, really building off Imagine Boston 2030, which looked at a number of areas of the city for enhanced and expanded neighborhoods to really contend with a lot of our, our housing shortage issues, uh, really having new master planning processes within these districts. And through that, we've been building in a lot of the, the findings and metrics and measures from Climate Ready and the Research Advisory Group report. Uh, to really have a solid aspect of the master plans that evolve in these areas and inform future district level zoning uh, in those uh, parts of Boston. We've also last year updated our resiliency checklist. Uh, this checklist has been around I believe since 2013 and is part of our Article 80 development review process. Uh, projects need to go through this uh, list, outline how they're uh, development program through design as well as over the lifespan of the project can contend with heat and precipitation sea level rise uh, it's also been updated to advance the mayor's uh, objective of having Boston be uh, carbon neutral by 2050 uh, with respect to the the overlay and the guidelines uh, we really see these two tasks evolving in tandem and informing one another um, in large part, you know, what we're trying to do, I think, through new construction and retrofits is, is elevate sites, elevate first occupiable floors, look to armor and flood-proof areas beneath that elevation, remove, relocate sensitive uses and mechanicals, while at the same time maintaining a neighborhood character and a, a dynamic streetscape. Um, some of the, the specific tasks we're going to be getting into with our consultant team is really looking at best practices and zoning precedents that are out there. Uh, there's some fairly rich material out of New York, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, as well as New Orleans. Uh, also more locally, uh, there are bylaws from towns of Hull and Dennis that uh, in integrate incentives for elevating buildings and new structures. Um, we we'll also need to be thinking about the thresholds for how the overlay and performance standards will be applied. Uh, will they be applied to any and all new construction and substantial improvements to a site? Uh, do we differentiate between commercial, residential, even within residential, you have different sizes and scales? Um, will there be 
exemptions. I know with our groundwater overlay district uh, projects under 50 or 75 square feet uh, do not need to comply with performance standards there. So things we need to think about um, as we get going with this effort. In terms of the spatial threshold, and Maya had already presented this map, uh, this was developed as part of our, our checklist update uh, developed by uh, Woods Hole Group and represents the extent uh, of area that we would expect to see flooded with uh, a 1% chance storm event in 2070 with 40 inches of sea level rise. Uh, that 40 inches we think is a, a sound measure. Uh, I believe there's greater than 50% likelihood that we'll see that 40 inches within that time frame. Um, and really much of the construction that's underway now, a lot of the, the build infrastructure that's in place currently uh, should be around during that time frame. So we think that this is, mm -hmm. although very extensive, uh, a good place to start in thinking about how uh, this overlay will be spatially applied. Uh, there's also top of water elevations that are referenced here as well. Uh, so that, again, we'd start with uh, those numbers for uh, the sea level rise, base flood elevation uh, to consider uh, potential occupiable floor levels or over time having projects have enough dimension within their first floor between ceiling and uh, floor to meet that elevation over time. Uh, now getting into some of the sort of drier zoning parameters, uh, we'll be reviewing our existing zoning, the base zoning, uh, existing neighborhood overlays, looking at height, setback, lot coverage, how those may need to be modified or made more flexible to address uh, the uh, new uh, future flood uh, data that we're going to look to implement. Also looking particularly at, at setbacks and lot coverage with respect to the streetscape. Uh, if we have different height dimensions between sidewalks and streets as they relate to the site and buildings, allowing enough space for transitional infrastructure that may need to go in there. Uh, to make that move from street into uh, a building. Uh, floor area ratio, another zoning dimensional standard, uh, something we would not want to lose through these upgrades and, and uh, resiliency design implements. Uh, floor area, it's basically gross square footage. Uh, but again, thinking about these transitional pieces of infrastructure that may, may need to go into place, such as stairs or ramps, if those are brought into a building footprint, uh, where can we make up that space elsewhere on the property within the building uh, so we don't lose that FAR? Uh, similarly, if we're looking to incent over time uh, relocating residential or sensitive uses from basements and garden levels, as well as mechanical systems that may be in the basement, um, do we look at additional building footprint or height so we don't lose that, that FAR dimension uh, with that relocation? <coughs> Uh, building height, something we definitely need to, to get to on this. Uh, currently, uh, how building height is defined really functions as, a, I think, a disincentive for project proponents that may want to be elevating their sites and buildings. Uh, building height is measured currently from surrounding grade. So I think in the overlay, the intent would be to have height measured from that future design flood elevation or first occupiable floor, whichever is higher. Um, if we go with that first occupiable floor, we may need to uh, cap that on a certain number of square feet or, or put elevation so proponents aren't looking to really extend that and gain an additional story that way. But again, something to think about through this. And also looking at, at height and density uh, to offset costs. A, a lot of this will be expensive, particularly with retrofits. Uh, do we look at, at those types of additional square footage or higher dimensional aspects? To, uh, to incent this, um, as well as, as thinking about funding streams to help advance those district scale measures uh, that Maya and, and Carly had discussed, uh, those shoreline uh, uh, infrastructure measures that are needed to protect broader reaches of the community and neighborhoods. Uh, along that same line, uh, we may need to consider zoning sub-districts, so these frontline properties that are right along the shoreline. Uh, where we're going to see that shoreline infrastructure coming into place, uh, do we need to consider different types of dimensional and spatial standards uh, specific to those parcels to help facilitate uh, these important uh, implements over time? Um, and then looking at our existing zoning articles, uh, Article 25, which is our current uh, flood hazard district zoning, that's really the domain of FEMA, the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, that article embodies uh, the flood insurance rate maps that FEMA puts out, a lot of the, the language in that uh, zoning article is devised by FEMA, so we may want to stay away from that, but again, consider how that's consistent with 
uh, overlay performance standards. Uh, Article 80, our, our development review um, component, which uh, has project uh, proponents really address how their the development, their project will impact the surrounding environment, as well as Article 37, the city's green building uh, zoning article, which uh, incorporates a lot of uh, the lead aspects and sustainability standards, how those can be enhanced to, to better represent and integrate uh, resiliency and preparedness as part of those aspects of our, our zoning. Um, also on the state level, we've got to consider Chapter 91, the state's waterways regulations. Uh, Chapter 91 has specific dimensional and use standards for, for waterfront development uh, specific to non-water dependent uses, so we need to be consistent with that, as well as how this is all going to work with uh, existing building code, which will be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I take that back. Uh, and large aspect of zoning is uses, so what, what's conditional, what's allowed, what, what's forbidden, particularly you know, specifically below that, that future design flood elevation, also non-conforming uses that are out there. If we've got a property that's, that's non-conforming, they want to implement these upgrades, how will we handle and manage and administer that? Um, and also through this process, I think we also need to be aware of uh, physical constraints and obstructions that may limit uh, these types of enhancements and improvements or financial <coughs> limitations that property owners may have. We may need to consider uh, sort of a broad array of smaller scale deployable solutions that may be allowed as of right uh, to be implemented in and around a site uh, to, to limit damage from future flooding. Uh, so things to think about with our, our zoning. Uh, with the guidelines, uh, a bit more exciting. Um, really, uh, the intent of this is to help sort of guide compliance with the overlay. Uh, we're looking to have a very interactive and engagement document that will be online that will cover uh, a number of different building types within the overlay, sort of frame out uh, illustrations and, and uh, renderings of these different types of buildings and, and the types of, of resiliency measures and infrastructure that can be implemented over time uh, to prevent damage from flooding. Um, thinking about what we're going to be getting into with uh, specific tasks uh, as with the zoning, really looking at best practices and examples that are out there. Uh, New York City has a, a wealth of, of documents and, and guidance right now covering everything from retail to industrial to retrofits. Uh, so we'll probably be speaking with them as to how these evolved and were developed and, and how they're functioning in practice. Uh, also, we'll be looking at that overlay and, and trying to identify the, the primary building types. So these guidelines, I think, will capture anywhere from 8 to 12 uh, typical building types that are within the overlay and look at, again, the types of best practices, performance standards, that design implements that we need to be carrying forward. Uh, also, looking at if there's differentiation between new construction as opposed to retrofits. Uh, retrofits clearly are going to be a huge aspect of this, given much of the build context of the city is, is going to be around through 2050, 2070. Uh, with that, we're going to have to engage, obviously, the preservation community, uh, landmarks, uh, accessibility, uh, look at existing uh, design overlay guidance as well that's specific to a number of neighborhoods within Boston. Um, and then, of course, the, the public realm. Again, if we have the spatial differentiation between the streets and sidewalks and, and what the site and uh, ground floor elevation is doing, do we need to look at uh, specific design implements for screening, for buffering? How do we look at existing uh, standards for uh, streetscape dimensions and, and street walls as well as for commercial districts and display windows? So a lot of things to consider that's currently in our regulations and how uh, this will relate to, to these, um, these aspects and dynamics of, uh, of the site. Um, and also integrating the, the new guidelines that Public Works is coming forth with uh, with respect to uh, the public realm and right away with design measures framed there. Uh, as far as engagement, again, we're, we're just starting out. Uh, we've already reached out and convened an advisory committee comprised of uh, staff from BSA, a Better City, as well as Boston Harbor Now. Uh, they helped us with the development of the RFP while helping as well to oversee and help guide us as we get into the, the development of the guidelines. Uh, we'll probably look to make, have some type of forum or charrette here to really engage the design and architectural community. I think that would be very helpful early on. Um, we're going to be looking to, I think, develop uh, some preliminary recommendations, some models, really some content 
to sort of throw out there with specific focus groups that relate to the development community, uh, accessibility, again, preservation, design, architecture, as well as, as a regulatory community. And then uh, get into the various neighborhoods that are going to be affected by this as well. Uh, get out with uh, these neighborhoods that uh, are within the districts and really sort of frame out what the recommendations are, get further feedback uh, to refine the zoning and the guidelines. Uh, we've got a relatively short timeline with this project. It is grant funded, so we need to wrap up most of this by the end of June of next year, uh, and then look to get before our zoning commission to promulgate uh, the guidelines and, and new zoning uh, soon thereafter. So, a lot of work, <laughs> be very busy. Look for a lot of input from you all as well throughout this process, so thank you. great to be here. There's a great turnout and obviously that really points to the fact that there's a lot of interest in this topic and it's certainly, as Jay pointed out, a tremendous opportunity for the city and for all of us to really advance um, a great waterfront but really advance a great quality of life for Boston. Um, when you think about opportunity, um, there's been so many great studies and as a practitioner, is for us is to, to really learn and research, use that research to our advantage and harness it as a part of the projects that we're doing. So I'm gonna show you a project that we're doing in East Boston. And um, really it's about the application. It's about the application of that information and how we put that into a site specific project. And unique to these types of opportunities, it really becomes very interdisciplinary challenges. And it, as a practitioner who also works with landscape architects and civil engineers, it also extends into a greater deeper body of people with stakeholders, city planners, and some of our civic leaders. And that's where I think the opportunity becomes tremendous, is how can we bring that together in coastal waterfront planning that um, really is not just site specific, but a regional challenge. And so from my point of view, as a site project that I want to show you, is that it really begins to capture not just the site, but how its effects are, <coughs> or co-benefits that can occur in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And so I'm gonna run through this um, quickly. Uh, we're working in East Boston, point right here, right around here, right behind Constitution Beach, right behind the airport, uh, between Wood Island and Orient Heights. And uh, really, it's a great location. As one of the things about working in many different cities, I always learn about new neighborhoods and the access points that you can get there. And certainly a great walking distance, lots of different mobility options. And so certainly this is a part of our premise when we study projects. Um, unique to this site is that it's really a neighborhood area that has smaller residential scale buildings. It's adjacent to some tidal filled lands, East Boston Yacht Club, Constitution Beach, and some DCR properties. So it has a lot of adjacencies that are very unique. Neighborhood scale, I think a lot of the coastal resilience projects we're going to have are going to be affecting smaller scale neighborhoods and being sensitive to the urban design is really important for us. And uh, these are some of the scale, some of the, it's a new construction project that we're looking at. And so there's a lot of sight lines to the water, not just providing access, but visibility. And as you move around the corner to the DCR property, it shows you the view um, to the yacht club and certainly to some of the DCR property with the athletic fields and the skating rink, and here's our little point where this project comes into the waterfront from some of the public areas, and it's a Chapter 91 project as well. And this is a view to the site. You see the coastal bank, some invasive species, uh, the residential scale, the yacht club, and you can imagine as a designer, there are a series of challenges that you know you want to occur, but you know, waterfront. People come to the waterfront for a reason. They love it great place to live. How, for as an architect here, how do we design a multifamily residential project on this waterfront as you look around? And I think this starts to tell a great story. Certainly we have very low tide conditions, high tide conditions, and this is a shot from March. And I think that's why a lot of us are here. It's like, wow, these areas are getting vastly affected. And this is, uh, you can see, I just want to go back and forth. You can see the piles right here, and you can see the piles right here, and there they are again. So I think it's quite a fascinating differences that occur very quickly. How long does that water stay around? How does it affect the designs that we're looking at? So taking the research that's been done, uh, these are some of the maps that Chris talked about from the Woods Hole Group. And they look at the probability of you know, the site that we're working on, which is right here. The probability is it going to get wet? 
You know, where is the water coming from? Where are the key flood pathways? And for our project, we're right here, right on the corner of what's beginning in present day probability, some site entry points. And as you heard some of the discussions about Chelsea Creek in this part of East Boston, Belle Isle Marsh, and this site, what we're at at Coleridge Street, there are three main areas that are bringing water into our sites at different levels. This is some of the projections at 2030 and 2070. So we see this information and say, wow, there's a, a bit of responsibility on behalf of our little site in one of three areas. And what can we do to play a role, not just for our developer and do a good quality project that obviously has, um, you know, has to be profitable for them, but certainly something that has a larger impact in the neighborhood. And this is what really is what we're passionate about as architects. And I think when you think about the history of Boston and you know how a lot of this is filled in, overlaying this, it gives you a lot of sense about what was once before, what it is today, and how things are changing. So when you look at the site, I just want to walk you through some of the regulatory components. So you know we're here for about coastal resiliency planning. But the fascinating thing is just another box that we are dealing with in terms of how to design projects. There's tons of regulations between you know, MEPA, DEP, Chapter 91, Conservation Commission, zoning, coastal resiliency planning, how you bring this all together in a very sophisticated, hopefully smart, you know, creative challenge. So unique to this site is that it's 19,000 square feet, it's very large. And when you're dealing with something which is next to a bunch of 2,500 square foot lots, we do a lot of community Review meetings is trying to educate people that this is not really the same size lot as what you're looking at next to each other. Uh, we study the zoning. And so these are just extrusions of what the zoning is saying. I think it puts a reference point for us when you think about the zoning challenges that may occur in the future and what is the zoning that's in place now and how do we want to think about zoning changes relative to coastal resiliency planning. These are the setbacks. But here's the interesting thing that I think Chris was bringing up, the 35 feet. Right? So what happens when you start to overlay some of the FEMA studies and how that rises up by a foot? Now we're at 34 feet we're working with. And when you think about traditionally along these areas, a lot of these residential scale, they're always built up about two feet. So I think there's been a lot of planning for this over the years and it's a part of our historic fabric. And when you think about the next phase, the climate ready uh, projections that Chris and Carly and Anam and Mia, Maya had been speaking about, for our site, this increase, because we're at a significant low point, we're talking about to get to that number is about six and a half feet. So now we're looking at possibly a 28 and a half foot difference um, along that area. And when you do the math with the base flood elevations that were discussed in some of the plopping, we're looking at a difference about six and a half feet. So it certainly has a very large impact at the pedestrian scale. And I want to put in frame of reference that lens as architects have that to make sure that we're paying attention to the urban design challenge. When we continue to overlay some of the other components, we have a chapter 91 constraints, that 50% of that's open, has to be open space. We have a harbor walk that we need to provide along the back area here, as well as a facility of public accommodation which is set back from the FPA line. So suddenly the problem gets more complex as we move through this challenge. And so what we did is that, before we really dove into the diving, we did the mapping and we did the techniques and say, where, where are we at zoning? If you have a 0.8 zoning and you deal with the 35 feet, and we think about some of the, the components around the Chapter 91, Harbor Walk and the FBA space, making sure we get good sight lines through the buildings, respecting the scale of the neighborhood that occurs between the marching of those smaller uh, family residences. And then how do we shape that? How do we shape that to get into a scale? And so what we did is really, wanted to make a recommendation as we're going through that process is that we're raising that six and a half feet. We'd like to maintain that 35 foot scale that gets us to a project of about 41 and a half feet. And so from a planning point of view, a couple of urban design components became important to us is that picking up that residential scale along Coleridge Street, providing views into the waterfront and then with the larger open space creating edges that provide safe visibility uh, to um, these areas, put eyes on the park, we'd like to say, as well as connections to a larger uh, infrastructure which takes you up to Constitution Beach with the Harbor Walk. From a planning point of view, um, this is a raised level deck, which is about 15 foot 5 relative to the street grade, which is about 9. We created a raised stair, we created ramps, so that all of our vulnerable points of entry into the building were above this design flood elevation. 
Um, our two points of entry are really our parking ramp, which I'll show you, we have an underground parking garage. Um, but we set those curves slightly up and, and we have our harbor walk over here, which I'll show you, and some of the coastal areas. So what you're really looking at is a section that put our garage below the um, design flood elevation and put our building above that platform and tried to make nice transitions on the edge. And I think this is where the challenge becomes. Working with our landscape architects with Halverson Design Partnership, I want to point out, also working with High Point from our civil, civil engineering, is that working together to create really nice transitional changes around the edges is so important so not, we're, we're not just building walls around our faith, but being smart about our creative solutions. And here's the parking garage below and some of the housing above. So from a coastal point, bank point of view, we're doing a little bit of cleanup along the debris. We're working on some of the plantings, of course. But when we implement this into this larger you know, bucket of design pieces, we are in community processes really saying, hey, look, we have to balance our density. Even though that lens is coastal resiliency, raising buildings, thinking about greater FAR and all those things, it really comes back to a scale. People don't really see these issues as much. And so we designed the building. At first, we looked at that pedestrian scale. It's a very 360 degree building. It is to pick up on the sight lines and the building ins and outs, try to make a modern project that respects its fabric. But it's this pedestrian scale of six and a half feet that uh, has been certainly of interest to us not creating walls to our community, but creating transitions that allow sight lines through the buildings, sight lines to the waterfront, access to the waterfront, so that when we look through these buildings, we provide openings that create visibility to the edges, create good public spaces that allow people to use stairs instead of walls as their edges. Here's our ramp along the outside, creating openings along the edges. Here's our garage door entrance. And then similarly, as a residential scale problem that we may deal with some of these issues, is this other balance between this larger DCR property. How do we balance that scale at, at that level? And so we wanted to show you another area where we created more of, um, I think, a, an edge condition that was raised. And you're starting to see how we brought our ramp up, became a part of the public space as it looked out into the park, our point of entry into the building, stairs that lead down into the harbor walk along these edges trying to maintain good open space relationships, working with the existing treescapes that are there. We have a, are working with our arborist and tree preservation plan to maintain that as well. As we move around the corner, Harbor Walk became a public space, creating seat walls along the edges and sloped landscapes uh, that can help make good transitions uh, to the edges. I also want to point out in our process here with our FBA space, our facility <coughs> accommodations, like, Okay, now how do we think about what that is? You know, is it a cafe? Is it a yoga <coughs> studio? Is it a, these are some of the ideas that came out. Is it an art space? Is it one of these things? But we thought, wow, why not create opportunities where we can bring uh, the waterfront to the building and possibly create kayak rentals or storages for those areas that people can move down to the edges. And I think it's also balancing accessibility, being graceful about the way we move up ramps that bring us up to these building edges. And so certainly from the waterfront point of view, it's really trying to create some access along the edges and some transitions that slope that respect the scale of our neighborhood and also have to hopefully try to capitalize uh, for our developers to making good marketable spaces that, that can be uh, rented or sold. So this is the storyline that I find interesting <laughs> is that we talk about this, this elevation height and we say, it's certainly the catastrophic event that is occurring, but it's the layers. It's the steps that you go through. It's sort of like that photograph that we showed from March of last year, which is you know, what happens when we're having this, this water at our, our knees, or what happens. So I'm gonna walk you quickly through a few little narratives, which is uh, some of the co-benefits and how it's affected by coastal resiliency. So you're looking at that uh, you know, mean high tide area, our coastal bank, and so working together, you know, we've preserved our coastal bank, included some you know, sea grasses that can help slow down that area underneath our harbor walk, allowing for drainage with riprap, building seat walls, making transitions, you know, moving into infiltration systems and drainage areas as we get up to our level. So certainly at that, let's say that, uh, I'm gonna say FEMA event, you know, where you get that first level, using that site wall to be a barrier, but something that is used for people to sit on, allowing for drainage, thinking about our storm water is still something that we're dealing with. 
oh, what happens when the sea levels rise again? Think about the soil conditions and the edges and the plantings, working with our landscape architects and our friends with civil engineers to make sure these transitions that really last and exist when it's a day-to-day -day event, but also work and function when we have that event where the water comes. And certainly, you know, with the, as the sea level rise sort of story can extend to can those kayaks be used as modes of transportation? And even more, can it be changed, you know, when something maybe catastrophic event happens, taking advantage of that chapter 91 space as being an area of refuge that can be converted for a place where the local community could be a part of. We're also using solar panels to think about our energy and thinking about ways that we can capitalize on that if power happens to be down. Looking back in the other direction towards um, the neighborhood um, that I love, you know, I live in Boston and in my neighborhood everyone sits on the steps. So it's that idea that you sit on the stairs and you know you engage uh, that whole pedestrian scale is really the biggest challenge that we've been finding with this coastal resilience planning is as you keep picking up the buildings, you know, what happens at that lower level. It's a lot of that is what's been happening with podium construction and parking in and out of the city that we're walling up those edges to provide for different functions that didn't occur traditionally. Oops, whoops, I think I lost something here, but I was on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll use my handle. Okay. <laughs> so, but it, but I just showed we're almost wrapped up here. There's, I think you got to go full screen. Maybe. If you go to view, yeah, view, view, and then full screen. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's good. So it's that pedestrian scale. So from the other side is really how do we study creating good streetscapes, good walkable streets, uh, thinking about our paving, thinking about our uh, bike and different mobility options, pathways, seating. Uh, certainly our parking and having access into, you know, direct access into the building. Again, what happens when the flood pathways come through, uh, creating, uh, thinking smartly about, um, you know, porosity along the sidewalks, engaging um, our public sector as being a part of that process, continuing to think about that as the water rises and the different events occur. Part of resiliency planning, we love to talk about water, but really there's so much more to it, as you know, with the building envelope. Uh, thinking about our energy, thinking about our uh, renewable energy with solar panels, our envelope, uh, thinking about uh, heat gains, thinking about acoustics. Uh, the script obviously is pretty involved. And so this kind of wraps up our little mini application study of what we're doing. Um, but I just want to just point out again how valuable it is to have a great body of people thinking about this challenge. And this is what's really exciting for us. It's the interdisciplinary challenge, not only just between the architects and the different professionals, but it's really a neighborhood problem. And so suddenly, like a small site-specific project can have a greater impact uh, you know, for all of Boston. That's what motivates us a lot. Thank you. This is a great set of presentations that flowed really nicely from the sort of broader context to these, I think, truly really exemplary projects. And my question is, um, how much longer do you think these kinds of projects will be exemplary, cutting edge versus the norm? And are, are we, you know, those of us who have been involved in, in creating and working with the committee and, you know, steering these projects, we're sort of always wondering where are we in the sort of continuum of the issue? I, th I think we're clearly at a point where the problem is accepted, it's acknowledged that it's a real problem. We've had a couple of floods that have really woken us up without a lot of damage. And we see these wonderful kinds of projects emerging. But where, where do you think we are sort of overall within the developer, real estate, architectural communities of getting to the point where this, this is what we're going to see more of going forward, the kinds of projects that you gentlemen are doing? You want to go first? No, go Sir? Yeah. Um, so you know, I work with a, a number of developers uh, as well as uh, the, 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 uh, the, the owner occupiers, if you will, right? Um, and I know that uh, from a development standpoint, uh, it's front and center uh, with with them, uh, it, it, and it's it's really about um, understanding that it will cost them money if they don't think about it, right? Uh, and and the developer community is uh, um, certainly uh, keen on not costing them money. So I think uh, it it is um, it's great that we're starting to see them get built. 
because then they then there's a reality behind it. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think that um, you know all the conversations that I have with my clients, they're they're definitely on top of it. Anything else? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I have the opportunity of working in resilience planning nationally, and I think that it really depends on where you are. Um, my hope is obviously that these kinds of projects will become the norm very soon. I also do a lot of work in the South, um, and uh, we, I, I like to think about this whole kind of sea change that we're in the middle of, because I do believe that the, the needle is moving. We are living in an, an incredible time. Um, we are taking um, collectively, we're working on trying to take a fork in the road that leads us toward long-term sustainability and vitality and survival of, the, of our species, right? Um, but it's kind of like a bag of popcorn in the microwave, and so you start off with like a couple little kernels that are popping, and Boston is one of the kernels, and the development community in Boston is one of the kernels, but I'm starting to see it sort of speed up, you know, that critical part in the microwave where it's all like Brrr! So that's sort of <laughs> starting to happen. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in Louisiana, and they're working on transforming the state into sort of a watershed-based perspective, and we're starting to try to engage the development community, and it really sort of depends on where you are. There are some folks that are still super ingrained. I had a man yelling at me in a public meeting that sea level rise isn't even happening. I'm making it up. It's all for my salary, you know, et cetera. So that's still there, but I think that it's, it's on its way out. I just want to add to that a little bit, which is... Um, the landscape or the coastal landscape is so diverse and because of that there will be unique solutions all around the city and I find that pretty fascinating um, there's also an enormous number of different typologies that contribute to this problem and so I agree at some at some point where education amongst professionals and the community and the civic leaders all begin to build uh, it will become more of a norm or a standard, and as you see the city start to take action with their zoning changes, that will create new regulation that will make this more of a norm. But I think the interesting part is the bell curve on the backside, where the exemplary statement is when collectively we can really address this problem and move on to something else that is new. <laughs> so. Um. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> one specific question and one sort of general one. The specific one is, it appears all of this is responding to, I'm, I'm talking about the picture I'm looking at here with, that Maya and Carly presented. Um, all of this is about coastal flooding. So what happens to extreme precipitation is the question. When we're raising the land along the edge, are we trapping rainwater? So is that some inadvertently are we creating a problem there? That's one that's a specific question. But the more general one is thinking about where we put all our investment. This is large scale solution, of course, you know, on the scale of the big dig or even bigger, right? Where are we putting our eggs? Are we putting them along the high risk areas, which is the edge of the water, or could we put it where people used to do things before? Build a school on the top of a hill, build a church on the top of a hill to provide refuge in the case of a disaster. Why, are, why is all the investment going to the edge? Do you, do you want to take that, Maya, or do you, would, do you want me to take that? I can add to it. Sure, and great questions. I mean, I think for your first one on stormwater, that's an issue that um, we continue to be aware of and worry about. We saw with the, with the floods this winter that uh, most, a lot of the flooding was actually coming up from the stormwater drains and not from over the seawalls. So it's an issue that we continue to try to better understand and figure out how it connects with the coastal flooding issues. Um, the Water and Sewer Commission is well aware of this issue. They started, um, kicked off some projects that were underway before the flooding, but then sort of went into higher gear around um, where to store water in the city and then upland from the city um, and how to really model some of these inundation events um, in terms of increased stormwater and how it connects with sort of some of this ongoing work and then other investments across the city. Um, I think it's a, a challenge that we're going to continue having to figure out how these two connect and how they work together um, so that we're not causing um, we're not causing problems by focusing on you know the coastal work. Um, but I think these are issues that will continue to be designed through and resolved as these projects move to further design and through um, getting closer to construction and implementation, we're still 
um, across most of these in the in the conceptual phase, in the engagement phase, um, in the buy-in phase, understanding the costs and the policies that need to change and how we move forward. And that's a big question that's going to have to continue to be resolved um, and advanced through design. Did you want to? Oh. I was just going to add to um, the question of how to prioritize because I think that's that's a lot at stake here. You see the mapping uh, and you see the studies and the research, there's real data there. And uh, I think that provides us opportunities to understand where our priorities are and really addressing those key um, flood pathways because they're not just, put it, put it on the, in the lens of it's not just the edge. There's a co-benefit that occurs between the edge condition and what it does inland. And you see that through the East Boston Greenway, you see that in the site that we're talking about, you see that in South Boston, is that there's a greater responsibility on these edge conditions to address um, resiliency planning because it has a large impact as not just site specific, but more of a neighborhood or even to some extent regional challenge that we have. So I'm sort of violating the unspoken rule that only two folks um, respond to a topic, but I, I wanted to kind of build on what my colleagues have said. Um, and, and emphasize that you should not think of this as just sort of a one-time thing. This is a very iterative, phased process. And you have to start at the edge for a couple of reasons. If we don't start there, we're not going to solve our stormwater problems because the water can't get out when you have high tides. So you have a rain event, and then you have the sea level rising, and the water can't get out, and so you're flooding inland anyway. So you kind of need to start at the edge. And also, just the perception of flood risk has the power to lower property values and if you do not kind of think about the p and people are living there now they're living they're working there now it represents sort of the most urgent place of focus at the moment if you don't address those issues you can face uncontrolled retreat which leads to slum and blight and things like that when we really have the opportunity to create a lasting vibrant area that improves quality of life for the community the other thing is sort of um, this long-term focus, the inland areas and the higher kind of more resilient areas also need to be a focus long-term, right? We're hearing people in higher density areas feel expressing that they're feeling more development pressure. They're concerned that they're going to be pushed out. And so one of the things that we're starting to move toward in, in some other areas, once you've sort of addressed the edge, we got to think about building the resilience of the inland areas, not just against sort of climate change pressures, but also increased population. And we want to also make those areas more desirable for people to, to move. So this is sort of like I think all of these things have to be thought of, and, and the stormwater issue is very much tied to the coastal issue, and we haven't necessarily all cracked that nut yet. There's a lot of research that's happening right now on those transition zones and the, inter, the, the relationship and interdependence between you know, flows that are coming from inland and these rising seas. That was a great um, narrative building, and I'm, I compliment all the speakers for speaking to pieces of that. So um, I was more intrigued around the conversation around building resilience upstream for you know, the flood um, storage piece, which I, I get the point that we have to start from the edges because the vulnerability are maximum and the resources there right now need to be de dealing with real problems. But I also feel there's a little bit of a danger when you focus on waterfront, focus on coastal communities um, without necessarily making a part of your vocabulary a watershed-based approach because everybody is then only focused on what can be done at the end of the pipe not necessarily what can be done upstream. Um, and in the case of the Charles, um, there was a huge piece of resilient infrastructure that was protected upstream, the natural valley storage area. For those of you, are, is hugely playing a part in saving the lower basin from flood impact. So I just feel like that's, that's something that has to be built into the narrative moving forward because I agree. The focus needs to be on the edge, and we need to think about infrastructure, which is both a combination of gray and green. But 
Um, if you don't build the upstream solutions into the narrative right now, it's always going to be more difficult to get to later because the resources are constrained. And the second point that I wanted to offer is the operations and maintenance piece of this, which is not the sexiest thing that comes um, as part of presentations that designers make, but it's really what needs the focus right now. So my hope is that it's not left <coughs> up to Maya and Chris to sort of figure out once we are all bought into this vision of greening our entire city to make that kind of investment into operation maintenance, training our workforce that takes care of this infrastructure or understands how it actually works. Um, public education is a big part of it. So just wanted to see if anybody wants to talk to those pieces. Thanks. <laughs> well, yes, administrative and governance is a huge aspect to this. And I you know Sustainable Solutions Lab just came out with a report last Friday framing out what some of those options may be. And that's one of those things that I think is going to be evolving uh, through this process when we get you know a sense of the scope and scale and resources that need to be managed and implemented through the, the conversations that we're having amongst property owners, regulators, as to what is really going to function function best there. So it's one of those things that I think um, you know will be coming forth in time. Um, and I think with respect to the the sort of upriver issues you had referenced, and I think Maya may have it, indicated this, the Water and Sewer Commission is doing a far deeper dive right now, doing uh, sort of dynamic modeling of, of flooding through their infrastructure um, and, and conduit and assessing which areas of the city could be surcharge locations, really a broad assessment of, of how stormwater can be managed throughout the city. So I know that they are really committed a lot of resources to better understand the vulnerabilities on that scale the same way. Uh, the Boston Harbor Regional Model has allowed us to really dynamically assess the, the coastal flood conditions and dynamics that are out there. So there should be great information coming out uh, from them moving forward. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists today. Um, I think we had a really nice picture of district-wide and then building level and connecting with existing environment, but I was wondering how you see with district-wide solutions coming in, these buildings connecting with future environments and these sort of holistic solutions, and how flexible are those designs and where do you think that'll come into the new upcoming studies? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can take it. I just don't want to keep talking. <laughs> so um, I think um, you may remember the slide from the South Austin presentation where we had the four tracks. Um, and the fourth track was sort of this inland and regulatory resilient solutions. And I think that that that's sort of like a longer term play, right? As the as you see redevelopment, new development, all of these things are sort of the ideas that they're going to be elevated um, uh, over time to, to or to be more resilient. And so um, the solutions that we've been developing at the district level are designed to tie into that sort of line of thinking. I won't make you feel bad. I'll keep talking. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a very, I, I love the question about flexibility because <laughs> Our future is so much geared around our adaptability, right? Of our, certainly our buildings, it makes it a fantastic design problem when you have to find ways to adapt them. Uh, but certainly the adaptability of the buildings relative to the infrastructure, another really fascinating thing. So I think it's another gear that we need to continue to advance and, and think about. Great. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and thank you to our speakers. I thought this was a really fantastic presentation. And um, also thank you to Bud and the Green Ribbon Commission and Jay and Anne Marie. Um, it's truly a collaborative effort. And I think we all realize that this work is also a collaborative effort. And um, I was really actually really happy to hear some.